Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 736. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is June 14th, 2022. All right, thank you for joining us for another program and episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could make it. A lot to talk about, as we always do. Find some news out there in the world of Christendom and Anglicanism and all the denominations around the world. And this week will not disappoint, I promise you. Now, up front, we, we need to be honest and truthful and transparent. I have allergies this week, so I took a Benadryl before the show. So I may seem a little loopy or drowsy or say things wrong. That's because I am on a medication that will stop me from sneezing on camera. Like you didn't see it last week because I cut it out, but I sneezed a couple times on camera. So um, it's just part of my life. I have allergies during pollen season in the summer and I live a life where I follow 70 degrees. So I'm going to have more uh, exposure to pollen than the average person. It, it is what it is. George, how are you doing this week? You don't look like you're on any Benadryl. No, I'm just naturally loopy and dopey. <laughs> I don't I don't need medication to achieve that effect. No, it's uh, it's the start of summer. Hurricane season started, and so uh, I'm all excited to get up and clean out the gutters and make sure the roof is all set, and my wife has forbade me from climbing and playing on the roof. And I'm just so disappointed because I guess I've reached the age in life where my wife thinks that the odds of my falling off and breaking my neck or puncturing myself on an exposed rusty nail are greater than any cost savings of not hiring a handyman to clean the gutters and check the roof out. So, Kevin, age has crept on and up on me unawares. I'm well, just an old man now. In fairness to Susan, George Conger got a uh, dangerous infection by stepping on a washer in the garage. So, you know, in deference to Susan, she's probably right here. You don't need to be on the roof <laughs> if stepping on a, a little washer in the garage sends you to the hospital. Well, I, I just repair cars and bare feet, and I thought uh, radiator fluid, antifreeze, kills everything. And so I didn't particularly worry about stepping on shark objects because it naturally be cleansed by the goodness of uh, hot uh, antifreeze. Yeah. Now, uh, we're going through, sorry, I'm getting lots of stupid texts here. Um, going here through the recession in Wisconsin, and uh, we're talking before the program, uh, you said, Kevin, I read on the news that 15,000 deer are killed on the roads of Wisconsin every year. And I can confirm that we almost killed four last week. That may actually solve the, the food shortage, George, if we can uh, get those uh, 15,000 deers into our food distribution system. That well, you know, that uh, the, pro the problem is the packing plants. <laughs> I just saw a big article, Smithfield, which is the biggest pork producer. Uh, they've got plants all over the country, or one of the biggest, is pulling out of California completely. Yeah. They're shutting down their pork uh, facilities. They're moving them back to the Midwest, Iowa, uh, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota. They're selling off their pork to pig farms in California, all due to government regulation and costs. The energy cost per employee, let's say you have a 100 man abattoir in Iowa, the cost for, for electricity is three and a half times more per employee in California than it is in Iowa. And California now has these laws that pigs have to have so much space they can't be penned into smaller containers. Mm -hmm. And that basically means if you have a thousand pigs, you now have to double the size of your farm to keep a thousand pigs. So not only are the middle class fleeing California, the pigs are fleeing California and moving to Iowa and uh, the Dakotas and uh, Idaho. So. All right, well, before we get to our, our program today, which is lots of interesting news, I did want to talk about the reality here post-COVID of this looming recession, the bear market, and kind of the, the global economy right now, where there are food shortages, gas shortages, energy shortages, and, you know, the church really needs to start preparing for this. And I know at uh, certainly leadership levels, churches need to talk about um, 
do we put in reserve some for our, our media community, not just serving the greater community? And uh, have you had these discussions? Yes, uh, at our on the agenda, we've had these staff discussions. Um, we support uh, Gateway to Hope, which is a food kitchen in Ocala run by a uh, church army priest, uh, James Giles. They've gone from feeding a few hundred every week to six, seven hundred every week uh, when they distribute food and prefer provide hot meals. And James has told me, Father James tells me it's getting worse and worse and worse each week. In our own parish, I'm starting to see people coming, have people coming to me saying, I can't afford my medicines and my groceries. I'm on a fixed Social Security income. Mm -hmm. The cost of food has risen 10% this month or whatever, and the cost of my medicine has risen. Can you help me? And so we're going to have to uh, make the hard decisions because we're not a wealthy parish. We're not, uh, with, we don't have bottomless wells of cash to give out. Most of our people are on fixed incomes. We basically pay as we go. Uh, how do we handle the walk-up traffic when things get really bad? Yeah. People needing money for gas, people needing money for food. When our own people are, you know, the little old lady who, you know, can't turn her air conditioning on because she can't pay her power bill uh, when it's going to, because electricity costs are going to be shooting up. Or have already started shooting up. Yeah, absolutely. So the the, the church is the all churches. Um, well, in my opinion, all churches, especially in this part of the country in Florida, are going to be faced with major questions of allocations of resources. I've canceled. Usually, I, I go to a train a week's training down in Naples. Uh, I'm just about finished my catechesis of the Good Shepherd training. I've canceled that this year because, you know, I just think the $2,000 spent on the fees and going to a hotel in Naples, Florida, is better put into the food pantry, is better put into the discretionary funds of the deacons who work with the, the homeless. Kevin, I really think things are going to get bad. Yeah. And then we're, as a parish, we're preparing for the roof to fall in on many levels. Yeah. And we're telling you this because the majority of our audience is clergy, the majority of our audience is dispersed around the world, and it's, you know, you really need to be thinking hard about, you know, the, the next coming months and years as we, we enter into a global recession. And, you know, your economy is going to be hit very hard, especially in the third world countries where you used to rely on the outside resources coming in financially to help you out. They may not be there. You need to, you need to plan for that um, and, and just be aware of that. Uh, things are going to change. Uh, it, it's going to be a season of uh, discomfort for those of us who are used to that Western lifestyle. And maybe it's a, a great chance for God to get a hold of us and, and, and get our attention. And it, on and the on the basic level, let's say we we bring in uh, three four times a year. We bring in outside speakers to have weekends where we have a conference on prayer. We have a conference on mm -hmm. grief and this and that. And we're asking ourselves, okay, we've got a conference that we're thinking about holding in September on prayer. The three four thousand dollars that we've put aside for that is that the best way to use our funds, or should we? Put it into the food bank should we put it into cash reserves keeping our own electricity on and you know these are questions that i think not only churches but households are going to have to deal with mm -hmm. should you buy a deep freezer and go up to sam's or costco and beat the uh, hyperinflation of pork products sure now that they're sure. shutting down plants in california uh, yeah, you too. I'm being All right. I'm being jocular, but it no. it is a real issue. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's we haven't hit the news. We're nine minutes in. Let's get to the news. Ten minutes in. All right. So uh going through my list of stories and we'll think about a title for this episode later. But uh my first story is Justin just got spanked by some primates in Africa. And uh he this discussion's been going on. Um for a long time, Lambeth 2022 had been delayed because of COVID, understandable. Um, but Justin's having trouble getting everybody on the team to show up for Lambeth. And he's expressed that very publicly in some letters back and forth with these uh, archbishops saying, you know, it's just not godly and frankly unbiblical that you're not coming to Lambeth. And this uh, jockeying has been going back and forth. I don't 
think we will see another letter from Justin in response to this letter from uh, Africa because it is it's like taking a two by four and hitting Justin across the face with wake up you're on the wrong topic you need to understand what is really going on here it and in fairness I have never seen such a wonderful written letter concisely from leadership uh, in GAFCON and Africa, George. Oh, Kevin, there's so much to say, but I do want to say uh, two of the last three of our episodes have been the highest viewed ever, and coincidentally, they had the most catchy titles. So I, I think, Kevin, if you're when you think of titles, think of Nigeria bitch slaps uh, Justin Welby or something, just <laughs> something like just to uh, uh, <laughs> something like that. But we don't even need a catchy title because the content for this one is so great. Mm -hmm. uh, May 27th, uh, Justin Welby wrote a letter co-signed by Josiah Wadawa Peron uh, denigrating the stance of Nigeria, Rwanda, Uganda for not coming to Lambeth. The letter was sort of over the top. It was, I would call it petulant, and uh, saying that the position taken by these three churches was unbiblical, that unity was above all. And I thought, but, you know... Uh, you, you said, I don't think Justin wrote this. You thought maybe somebody else I really wrote. don't because I don't think he's unless unless he too is on Benadryl, Kevin. I it just was not polished or in other words, in England when you call someone a liar, you don't call them a lie. You no. say, Well, they're not being entirely straightforward. Right. You use euphemisms to mm -hmm. express, you know, uh statements that uh we more vulgar Americans uh would say more directly. And this was very direct, which was unusual. Well, uh, all over the weekend, uh, the Nigerians, Ugandans, and Rwandans released a letter. We, uh, we got a copy via email, and uh, it's also been posted on the Church of Nigeria's uh, n television service. So it's not all not out there in a lot of places, but we were fortunate to get a copy. And it's a point by point refutation of Welby's arguments and is really worth going into because as Kevin as you said this is the most well written the most cogent the most this is one of the best things I've seen coming out of the leadership oh absolutely um, and it doesn't have the the polish that you know we need to send it through the press offices here at GAFCON we need to be sure that you know uh, the the leadership character the the Martin Mins the the Duncans have looked at it before it gets released this is just flat response uh, to what they see going wrong with Justin well the f the first paragraph starts off the ball rolling it says uh, we reject your claim that we are not following the Bible mandate or that we are placing politics above scripture. That's absolutely false. And, mm -hmm. But what you're doing, Justice, is you're stressing unity above all. But there are ethical and moral issues that exist. And we are, and then I quote a quote, we are not a community that indulges in unrepentant sinners. In other words, by allowing unity to trump ethics and morals and Christian doctrine, we're indulging people who are doing acts contrary to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And then they go on to then reject Justin Welby, lecturing them on the Bible and raising the, the Council of Jerusalem as the example of how people should behave. And they come back by saying, Justin, you are, here's a quote, virtue signaling, you are virtue signaling doing a sort of virtue signaling that condones evil by hiding behind endless prayer and discussion. And They've got Justin's number. They've got Justin's number. He is engaged in virtue signaling, showing the world, showing the non-believing, non-Christian world that he is a good fellow by going through all this faux bio discussion and uh, uh, meetings and prayer. And they say, and Justin, you're biblically illiterate. The Council of Jerusalem was led by James of Jerusalem, not by St. Peter. And the bi biblical ethics, I'll read this, have a biblical excellence. Biblical ethics may not ultimately be decided by the Archbishop of Canterbury, oh, just as oh, Peter <laughs> did not decide the outcome of the Council of Jerusalem. The bishops did. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. shared by James, not by Peter. Mm -hmm. We have a voice, they say. And the Archbishop of Canterbury is not the one who can make decisions for all of us. And they go on to say, and it's disingenuous to Lambe, uh, Welby's interpretation of Lambeth 1.10, which in 1998 was said that, you know, we, we cannot condone homosexuality. Welby is taking other points of that, saying we need to be loving and kind to homosexuals as uh, people in the homosexual lifestyle, as to say we're approving this. Uh, yet, and Justin says, I'm honoring Lambeth 110. But then the uh, African bishops say, well, you're having partnered gay bishops involved in all aspects of this conference. Mm -hmm. And then this, and I'll quote again, is dishonoring to our Lord and undermines the integrity and message of the church. The Lambeth Conference, as constituted by, by Justin Welby, is dishonoring to our Lord. Friends, this is, excuse my vulgar language, a bitch slap across <laughs> Justin Welby's face. Yeah, well, and now to their point, Justin Welby would go on camera right now and tell you that <coughs> the, the primates meeting held in London where they uh, passed a resolution holding the Episcopal Church uh, accountable for their actions uh, with Gene Robinson and many other uh, affairs, that he held them accountable according to the primate's wishes. Well, of course I did. The primate said I should uh, make sure that uh, the Episcopal Church doesn't do anything for their years. I did that. I honored that. And it's like he lives in this different world. You know? Well, he certainly didn't honor that because we saw example after example after example. Nobody believes that. Oh, but the, the primates go on to say, um, Justin Welby criticized the African primates for why don't you take seriously the environmental problems and corruption and social justice issues? Um, those are biblical mandates that we must pursue, and you're not being here means that you don't care about poverty. And the African response was, you know, you're teaching us to suck eggs. We're the ones living in poverty. And we're the ones in, on the forefront of the environmental collapse that we're seeing in many places in Africa of uh, overpopulation, of poverty, of government corruption. But the main, and how quote, the main job of the church is to feed the people with the pure word of God. Consistency of preaching and teaching the pure word of God is more important than social justice. It's not that they don't think social justice is important. It's very important, but it arises from the preaching and teaching of the pure word of God. So again, Justin and the African prim uh, primates are on different planets when it comes to understanding the work of the church. So Ma just, yeah. well, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, no, no, you're right in this, but let's stop with this, this, this precept of Justin's understanding is that you, you, can, you, you have to individually prioritize saving the world. And from the Christian concept and, and understanding, saving the world can only be done by saving souls. It's a completely different understanding. He thinks saving the world will save souls. And we understand that saving souls will save the world. Completely well, different. I mean, we, we can look at history and see how this works. In America, it was because of people convincing uh, the, the majority of the North that slavery was an affront and abomination to God. Mm -hmm. That, you know, you are, you know the African uh, slave is my brother in Christ. That we had the, the war that caused the greatest loss of life of any American war. It was a religious war in many aspects. And it was only happened because people took their faith and put it into action that we must stop slavery in the North. That was, you know, the worldview. So, and but in other words, action follows the faith of a convinced Christian. And we are not dealing with a world full of convinced Christians. The job of the church is to convince people of the truth of Jesus Christ and allow the lay people then to put that into action. That's the, the message that the Africans are sharing. Mm -hmm. And Welby rather instead, you know, Justin Welby's, I, I don't have a very high opinion on it as our viewers know. 
Uh, his latest thing is that he and all the bishops in the House of Lords are saying that the British government's policy of sending illegal immigrants who try to cross the channel from France to England by sending them to refugee camps in Rwanda to be sorted out by the government, that's immoral. That And they've got such harsh, you know, God, this is contrary to God's word, this is immoral. This is a political issue. And there are moralities on both sides of this issue, yet they cannot say a clear word about human sexuality. They can't cl say a clear word about abortion. They can't say a clear word about the true ethical issues that are facing our world. Instead, they've got to wrestle in the mud of party politics. Well, now Justin's taken this a step further. You know, he and the Church of England is not able to speak to uh, the culture around them. Now he's a, mm -hmm. uh, made it so that when Lambeth gathers, any resolutions that are passed are mere suggestions. So you have castrated the primates and the bishops and taken away their ability to speak the word of God to a broken world. This world has, in my opinion, never been more broken. And it's never needed uh, a relationship with God and revelation through the scriptures and to see real Christians walking in the face and the real salt and the light than any time in its history more than now. And Justin Welby has said, by the way, when you guys show up, and if you were silly enough to make a resolution, it's just a call, it's a suggestion. Um, please, culture, don't think this church has a voice. Ouch. The, Justin Welby last Thursday uh, published a video on the Lambeth Conference website, and what he said, Kevin, was exactly that, that we are not going to have resolutions from this conference. At most, we'll have 12 general calls made by the bishops, and the bishops are to go home and then over the next year, year and a half, have Zoom meetings and small groups to discuss how we might implement these general calls in the life of our individual parish uh, dioceses and provinces well and Welby goes on to say that uh, the Lambeth seeks to dis quote discern what God is saying to the church and to offer that discernment to the whole church not to order people about each province is to decide on its own response and then he goes on to say when Lambeth uh, Lambeth says something quote it doesn't mean it's going to happen this shows an ignorance of church history. This is the 15th Lambeth Conference. The first was in 1867. Each conference up until now had resolutions all across the board, hundreds of them in some cases. And the only time, and in the past, there would be individual bishops who would object to a resolution sure. or make a big noise about it. Uh, women's orders or yeah. Rhodesia, things like that. It was only in 1998 that we had a minority statement after the conference on human sexuality where Lambeth 110 was rejected. And only after Lambeth 1998 did the Episcopal Church and the Canadian Church, once they got home, say we're not going to honor this. But they voted because for at the their... Lambeth Conference in 19... Yes, you're absolutely right, Kevin. Yeah. The 1998 Lambeth Conference, the majority of American Episcopal bishops voted for Lambeth 110, including those who were promoting what we would call the gay agenda in their own diocese. Jay Walker, the Bishop of Long Island, uh, look him up on Wikipedia and his troubles with penthouse magazines and all this and that. Colorful character. Big advocate for the gay movement. He sat right in front of John W. Howe, my bishop at the time of Central Florida. And Bishop Howe voted, you know, it was a, how you voted was by show of hands. And as each uh, amendment came forward to weaken or soften or change or reject, or can soften, change or object, all defeated, finally comes to the last vote. And Walker raises his hands in unison with John W. Howe, as did the majority all Episcopal bishops, because they all sat in national groups, more or less. But when they got home, they then got rolled by their gay activists, and within five years we had Gene Robinson's consecration. They ran away from their vote at Lambeth. So, Welby is saying that Lambeth doesn't order people about. Technically, it's true. You submit to the will of the church, as it did for the first 13 conferences, up until Lambeth 98. 
Uh, it's only on human sexuality that we have people saying, no, it doesn't apply to me. Yeah. So Justin Welby's thing that we're going to make the call on 12 sort of general topics that, you know, not specific things. Um, mosquito nets. And mosquito just go nets. Home and, and, and contemplate and meditate on uh, mosquito nets for the world and, and climate change. And uh, I know acid rain isn't a thing anymore, but the, why don't you just contemplate acid rain? And you're sending them home not with the knowledge and understanding and call to raise up their nation to uh, a loving relationship with Christ, you're calling them to start worshiping the world and worshiping uh, climate change and, and worshiping uh, these things that, yeah, they're important, but there's something much more important. And um, it, it's hard to watch this, but watching it now in this context, in this day and age, it's so wonderful to see Anglican archbishops get it and they're willing to uh, put their words on paper uh, to this point. This, this is an embarrassment for Justin, George. But, yeah, and Kevin, we have to put this, in, I think, in a bigger context. Mm -hmm. uh, less the, the bishops who will be at the Lambeth Conference July 28th to August 4th. Let me, uh, Somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah, it's July 26th to August 4th, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Represent less than half of the Anglicans in the world. I think the number is 46 or 48 mm percent. -hmm. The GAFCON and the Global South movement represent over three quarters of the Anglicans in the world. Uh, the Global South and the GAFCON meetings have produced statements of faith and morals. We think of the Jerusalem Declaration. Absolutely. We yes. think of the things that have come out of the various uh, uh, meetings. Lambeth is walking away from the bishops charge to preach and teach the faith handed down by the apostles instead and to let's turn this into a graduate uh, uh, discussion session you know bullshit session in the door in the commons room well, I think it's worse than that Justin is trying to uh, imitate as uh, presiding Bishop Jeff, uh, Catherine Je Jefford Shorts did we're going to be a mini United Nations yeah, you know, we're going to get here, and we're going to discuss the same thing that the World Health Horth My gosh, I can't. Oh, Benadryl, sorry. The World Health Organization discuss the same thing that the United Nations discusses. The same thing that's discussed at the secular level. We're going to discuss here at the church because we don't need to discuss church things. There's just so much in the church that's unbalanced and we don't understand. Let's let's just talk about the things we understand, and that right now is climate change. And, and here's the thing, Kevin, here's the thing. Let's say, let's take the World Health issue. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? They may talk about COVID and, or monkeypox or whatever's happening by July. But instead of talking about the morality of individuals making a choice to receive a vaccine or not receive a vaccine, talking about the moral, ethical issues of personal autonomy versus your responsibility to the community, they're basically going to say, Here's what the experts in public health, like Dr. Fauci, say, and we think that you should do what Dr. Fauci says. Not addressing the moral, spiritual, philosophical, ethical issues in an issue, but rather parroting government and NGO talking points. And as, as an American citizen, you've seen the lies that the experts have told, taught us over the years uh, about what's happening in our world. And maybe this is an American perspective, but, you know, just because a self-proclaimed expert says it so, I don't necessarily <laughs> believe it. Self-proclaimed experts, political es experts said, nothing will change in this global economy if we give stimulus to people who don't have jobs because of COVID. We're going to give people a paycheck, and they'll get unemployment, and we'll give them stimulus checks, and nothing will happen. We'll just print money for two years. Nothing will happen, George. Nothing. And suffering. Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, former uh, head of the uh, Federal Reserve, says, yeah. I don't understand why we're I'm having shocked. this inflation. <laughs> Kevin, you know, take Economics 101 and you'll understand mm -hmm. why we have inflation. You know, these experts have just... 
put us in the spot we're in today. Yes, they, we, all right. Where I, where I, and my fellows, my peers on the vestry have to decide who do we feed. Yeah. Who do we? Whose medicine do we help buy? Whose gas tank do we fill? The consequences of their actions are not okay. Here's our plan to do this program to reach more people, more. Event, children's programs or teaching programs more outreach more evangelism programs into we need more money for food kitchens we need more money to keep people alive and going that's a consequence of their stupidity yeah. all right <clears throat> okay that was 20 minutes no, it does uh, keep me occupied it does keep me busy so <laughs> no no all right let's move on to some uh, local news here in america uh as pe if you don't know and it was kind of the big uh, news uh, last month the uh diocese of south carolina represented by the acna the acta branch and the diocese of the south carolina uh the episcopal branch uh, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of South Carolina made a decision, and it was a split decision. It said these parishes will go to the Acna diocese. These parishes will go to the Tech diocese, and we're done with it. You can't come back, and, and we're not going to hear this anymore because basically we don't know what we're doing. And there is going to be a rehearing now, George. Yeah, the diocese, the Acna diocese, has is not involved, but. Eight parishes uh, affiliated with the Acne Diocese have made their own move to have their particular case reheard, and the South Carolina Supreme Court has agreed to hear seven of the eight. That, which so is amazing, that, because in their an announcement and decision, they said we're not going to. This is it. So they are willing to rehear some of these. So, and this actually means that they're on their face of it there's enough merit to be considered it's not just some hail mary at the end of the game just throw the ball and hope somebody catches it down at the touchdown uh th 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 this is good news now means more money means more time but the game may not be over but at the same time for those who were saying i told you so i told you so i told you so the diocese, Episcopal Diocese, announced that they've hired, that they've appointed a man to be canon, uh, responsible for all sorts of things, including bringing back, reintegrating those uh, eight parishes back into the Episcopal Church. And he's a partnered gay man. So it's, it's, it's almost too on the nose to be true that that they appoint a partnered gay man to oversee these parishes who are fighting tooth and nail not to come back <laughs> the guy they have working with them to come back is a partnered gay man oh my goodness uh he may be fully competent i'm saying nothing about his abilities and his know. character it, or anything but it, the issues that split the church yeah this it, is not a good not a good uh <laughs> Well, Not a good image. If, if I were the Episcopal Church and I wanted to return evil, this is a great way to do it. You know, you know, na 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 to you guys. You know, we, and and the Episcopal Church thinks they won in the Supreme Court. The ACNA um, Diocese of South Carolina thinks that you know it was a split decision. Um, it's it's really hard to tell now that they're having a rehearing because a rehearing kind of self admits we didn't get it completely right this time. And we'll have to revisit some of these issues, at least at a parish now, level. Now, now, we've started the rehearing process. I don't want people to be overly optimistic because there's still sticks that can be spoke, stuck into the wheels, yeah, yeah. spokes of the wheel, and yeah. sl slow this down. But the first hurdle has been overcome by seven of the eight parishes. The eighth parish who didn't get the position, it's done. Mm -hmm. The other seven, there's still hope. And we say there's still hope, and, and, and George brings up an important point. When you go to court with the Episcopal Church, it is their fight and struggle and pure desire that you never get your day in court. They go and they file uh, uh, brief after brief after brief to make sure that the actual issue you're going to speak to never gets to the judge. It's all fought back and forth uh, over briefs. And um, Alan Haley can tell you about that. Uh, he's written blogs about that. Um, they don't want this discussed in court. All right, for our next story, uh, it's a, it's another 
uh, tech story, it talks about a diocese that wants to merge with another diocese that they used to belong to. Now, we've talked a lot about uh, this, the financial struggles within the Episcopal Church, especially at the diocese level. I'm here in Wisconsin. They're going to combine all three dioceses into one because there's just not the money and the ability to support three dioceses. We, Michigan is famous. I think your church is bigger than the Diocese of Michigan, and they don't have any money. Northern, Northern Michigan. Northern, Northern Michigan. Michigan. And so you, you see this all around uh, North America here where um, they're, they, they're trying to find ways to survive. And uh, it's interesting to watch what's happening now between Fort Worth and Dallas, George. The Episcopal portion of the old Diocese of Fort Worth uh, the ones that fought and sued Jack Geiger and Ryan Reed over all these years, they've lost. They're just, it's now final in Fort mm -hmm. Worth and has been for a while. And the Rump Diocese that remained loyal to the Episcopal Church called themselves Fort Worth for a long time. And when they lost, they couldn't, so they called them the Episcopal Church in North Texas. Well, they're not able to make it on their own as a diocese. They can't afford a bishop. They've got a retiree who's taking care of them, a part-timer. And so they've got to join a, an Episcopal diocese for oversight and for health reasons. Well, they originally came out of the Diocese of Dallas about 40 plus years ago. But the Diocese of Dallas is conservative. It's one of the few remaining conservative bastions in the Episcopal Church. D Dallas is an excellent diocese, it's an excellent bishop. I'm a canon of St. Matthew's Cathedral in Dallas, uh, honorary canon. Sure. And uh, Fort Worth people said, oh, we don't want to be, we'll get cooties if we go to back to Dallas. So they've asked to be joined to the Diocese of Texas. Now they can do that because once upon a time the Diocese of Texas was the whole state of Texas. That's right. Yeah. So they can go back to it even though they were spun off from Dallas. And it's because there's enough of a liberal a minority, well, not want to say minority, but it's like 50-50 there in Texas. Uh, there's some liberal areas, there's some conservative areas. Austin has a lot of liberal churches, a few, but it also has a lot of conservative churches in Houston and various other places. So Fort Worth, the Tech Fort Worth people are going back to Texas. And I think it's for politics. And I think it's for money, because they're all dying. They don't have any money. They don't have resources. And the Diocese of Texas has more disposable income than Dallas does in this case. For now, we'll have to see how things look in the future and after this recession. Um, we talked a lot about the Ukraine war. Uh, Ukraine war. I'm going to call it the Russia war, not the Ukraine war. The conflict in Ukraine, the war from Russia. Um, and the Orthodox Church's role in... Uh, condemning it or endorsing it or how to deal with the politics when it looks like Putin is the boss of the Russian Orthodox Church not just the boss of Russia and I think it's coming to a head now because you posted a story on Anglican.inc that says Hellerion has been fired what's going yeah, on? Hilarion, it, Hilarion was the head of the right. Department of External Church Relations in the Metropolitan of Volkolomsk a local lump. It's metropolitan of a place in Russia. <laughs> he essentially was the number two guy. Uh, before Kirill became patriarch, he had Hilarion's job. Right. And Hilarion will probably was always sort of touted to be the next patriarch after Kirill retires. He's fluent in English. He has a PhD from Oxford. He's uh, basically the church's diplomat. Well, and Hilarion has been very strong in the past about, you know, Russian Orthodox Church is saving uh, the Ukraine from Nazis and Nazi, neo-Nazis and things like that. And the West. And, and the, the West. And everything else. And is. this and that. And, well, the World Council of Churches meets in September in Germany. And the Orthodox members of the World Council of Churches held a pre-conference meeting in the Eastern Orthodox Churches. Uh, Greeks, the Romanians, Bulgarians, so on and so forth, held a pre-conference meeting in Cyprus uh, last month. And at this, they released a report, which were their aims and hopes and goals for the WCC General Assembly. And it discussed the war in Ukraine. And Hilarion did not, Hilarion was the 
the Russian representative there, along with a very large Russian delegation, because they're the largest Eastern Orthodox Church, and Hilarion let this pre-conference report essentially condemn the Putin government. Calling. In other words, instead of just some sort of milly moused call for peace, there's right on both sides. There was not an outright rejection of Putin, but it was certainly not what Kirill and the Russian government wanted. And so last was we, last week, uh, a week before, Hilarion was fired wow. by by Kirill. He was demoted. Now it didn't say he was fired, but he was transferred from his post of being head of the Department of External Church Relations and Metropolitan of this area of Russia to being Bishop of Budapest. This is a job he had 20 plus years ago on when he was climbing the ladder. Yeah. Now he slid down the ladder down to be the Bishop of the Russian Orthodox Diocese of Hungary, Budapest and Hungary, Metropolitan of Budapest and Hungary. This is demotion. In the Diocese of Central Florida, this is like being sent to Okeechobee. Uh, well, no, back it, in, in, in the days of Stalin, this is being erased from the picture. I mean, yeah. But, <laughs> so he's not been transferred from uh, uh, Winter Park to uh, Okeechobee. Uh, he's not been shot, but he's been transferred from Winter Park to Okeechobee okay. in Floridian terms. Wow. All right. Uh, last week and our last episode. Uh, hey, you posted stories about this for the longest time, and we talked about uh, the transgendered uh, Lutheran bishop. And it's taking an interesting turn now because there's more and more evidence that, that, that's come out. And this is very normal for how a story develops on Anglican Unscripted and Anglican Inc. It says there's always more to the story. You and I, we always say first reports are always wrong. And there's always more to the story. Catherine Jeffords uh, Shorey is famous because she was a dean of a seminary before she became uh, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. Well, you look into it, there's always more to the story. Here we have a counterfeit woman uh, as bishop of the Lutheran ch in the Lutheran Church who is apparently, allegedly, corrupt. We've discussed corrupt bishops all the time. What's the more to the story here, George? Well, uh, Megan Rohr, mm -hmm. the former bishop of the uh, Sierra Pacific Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which is Northern California and bits like that, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. She identifies herself as a man and she calls herself transgendered. She's married to another woman. Um, she it's extraordinary if you look into her career how this person became a bishop because she really doesn't have a good resume. She essentially was rector of a parish, she was pastor of a Lutheran parish in San Francisco. It was a tiny parish with less than 50 odd people on a Sunday. And by the time she left to become bishop, it was down to 22 people. The church did have some money in its bank account. And she was paid a salary of $90,000 plus a housing allowance, which is a real, that's better than my salary when the Episcopal Church is famous for overpaying its priests. And I was going to say, that's but, above the Episcopal Church's guidelines for paying a priest in that size church, right? 50, a 50 person church, yeah. Kevin, getting half of that. Absolutely. At best, even in San Francisco. Well, this parish had a day school, had a preschool, nursery school attached to it. And as the chairman of the board of trustees of the preschool, uh, she, Bishop Rohr, uh, asked that the finances be all done to save money by their internal bookkeeper at the church. And they merged the bank accounts. Well, sure enough, paying somebody what hundred and fifty thousand a year with the church of less than fifty people on a Sunday, they ran through their cash. And so she, she directed that her salary be paid out of the income from the day school, which was a separate corporate entity. It was on the same property, and there was interlocking governance, but it was this different corporate entity. 
And the day school discovered this when at one point the teacher's checks bounced. And so there are allegations of financial misconduct mm -hmm. of, in essence, now the original story that she was fired because she was mean to a Latino gay priest and had him fired on a Mexican holiday. Uh, that's all true. Uh, but I think the reason why, even though she's resigned, they're still going to have a trial of her conduct goes back to this uh, commingling of funds um, and not alleged commingling of funds as claimed by uh, her detractors and in the complaints lodged against her. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's a bad business. It's it's it has and it has nothing to do with sexuality or any gender, of the issues. Yeah, this no. is just like Charles Benison in the Episcopal Church got hammered not because of his liberal views, but because uh, where do, I don't want to open that can <laughs> no, of worms. But because any, of conduct that any person yeah. would be met, nailed on, uh, yeah. ignoring abuse and whatnot. It, it's, it's nice to see accountability within the church, uh, the Episcopal Church. ACNA has been doing a wonderful job with its accountability and holding bishops and clergy accountable is something that the church needs to do. And it needs to do it in a very public way so that the world can see that we don't allow this. We don't allow corruption. We don't allow uh, certainly sexual corruption or abuse in any form within our churches. And when we see it, we'll call it out and we'll let you know that we call it out. And I, we had that happen last week in uh, the ACNA where they uh, inhibited uh, Bishop Atkinson. And I thought we could talk about that here because it's another great example of even with the most perfect doctrine filled with wonderful godly leaders, uh, a church is hard to run. And uh, we see that because I think we're up to four bishops within the ACNA over its uh, uh, entire lifetime of 13, 14 years that have been defrocked or inhibited uh, in some way or, or form. And that's because it's hard work, George. And there are one or two more who need to be hailed. Yeah, hailed yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure they're on the docket. <laughs> well, uh, Bishop Atkinson is a part of ANIC. We used to say ANIC until people told us to say ANIC, the Anglican right. Network in yeah. Canada. He uh, was an independent, uh, had the VIA, I'm, I'm sorry, I've forgotten yes, the name, sir. but he had a church association movement under his authority. And Charlie Masters, the Bishop of Anik, brought him on board, and he was consecrated a bishop as a suffragan assistant within Anik, with responsibilities over these congregations. At the time, there were objections raised by some fairly significant people within the Anik, saying that uh, this fellow, it looks good on paper to add more churches and add more people and this and that, but the way he's doing things, we don't think is appropriate well tie at but charlie ignored this because you know why luke a gift horse in the mouth uh <laughs> we're getting Charlie's all these the, parishes the on the prayer guy in the world and he probably didn't see a problem once again right doctrine great leadership church is still difficult yeah. oh so eventually complaints were filed against him on some of the same issues that were raised in the objections against him and the way they are couched is we really don't know exactly what he's done. But he was engaged in intense discipleship. Ouch. <laughs> so, what, so what's that mean? Well, how people in close to the situation, but who are not part of the investigating committee, say mm. he was engaged in spiritual tyranny and uh, spiritual bullying. Mm. And had some, you know, God has told me that this is how we, this is the answer to this stuff. He had revelations that were not found in the Bible, but were found in his own conversations with the and Lord. This allegedly, yes. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is not in the final presentment that was brought, that will bring him to trial. This is what people in Anak have told us. And so an investigation was launched. And the committee could have reset, reset, oh, there's nothing here. Oh, well, we'll slap him on the wrist, say, they're there. Bad boy, don't do it again. 
all the way up to this, which is he's inhibited and he's going to face further hearings, which may result in his being removed from the ordained ministry of the Anglican Network in Canada. So this is a developing story and sort of the worst outcomes for Bishop Atkinson at this stage has been hit. It would be a good outcome from the ACNA because Anglican Unscripted and Anglican TV and Anglican Dot Inc. would not exist if the church held its leaders accountable. We'd have nothing to talk about. It would be very boring. We would just talk about our health, the weather in Florida, recession news and stuff like that. But uh, because the church is broken right now, we have full-time jobs doing this. Uh, it's a woke world, George. And the president of Ireland has determined that the terrorism that we reported last week in Nigeria, where 50 people were shot at a Roman Catholic church, is the caused by, and he was, he was wrong here, it's actually white privilege, caused by climate change. And you and I know climate change is yesterday's news. It, everything now is caused by white privilege. And so he's a little slow on the uptake, but he got slapped by the Nigerians as well, George. Michael Higgins is the president of Ireland, and the president of Ireland is the head of head of state, mm -hmm. which is different from the prime minister, who's the head of government, or the Taoiseach, right. as they call them in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Now, Michael Higgins looks like the mascot of Notre Dame, yes. except he's old and has white hair. <laughs> he's short, he's stout, he looks like a leprechaun uh <laughs> you said it he, i didn't say it <laughs> okay well he in his official head of state uh duties offered his condolence for the massacre in owo uh in nigeria and then he goes on to say you know the root cause of this is climate change which is causing uh herders from the north of uh, cattle ranchers in the north to move south and this is a clash with farmers and the church and the catholic bishop in the town where this massacre took place says don't be an idiot man this was caused by isis the problem is not climate change the, we're facing climate change but the problem is militant islam and the jihadists who want to kill christians because this is not on the border between where the climate where the people are fighting that's the plateau state that's kaduna that's where ben kwashi is you know and his friends and people are being victimized by boko haram the Fulani tribesmen this massacre was in the far south where there is no uh real muslim presence this was done by isis yeah. and to say it's done by climate change and refuse to recognize the evil done by militant islam excuses the evil done by militant islam this is the nigerian response to the bishop to the president of ireland's rather foolish statement yeah. all right in our final story the head of the acc is retiring and there's going to be a new person in charge and we should talk about the outgoing person first george before we talk about the new person Desaiwa Daiwa Faron retires as the Anglican Consultative Council's General Secretary mm -hmm. after the Lambeth Conference at the end of the summer. He's a former Nigerian bishop who has basically been an utter disaster from GAFCON's point of view, uh, at total success from Justin Welby's point of view. He has, even though he's Nigerian, his loyalties have laid with the institution of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Liberal North. Sure. And Adaiwu Faron is timed out. He's done. And their search was made for a successor. And this morning at a pre press conference in London, uh, the successor was announced. It's Bishop Anthony Pogo. Anthony Pogo is from South Sudan. For the past several years, he's been the Archbishop of Canterbury's international advisor. Anthony Pogo is a bit of a cipher. Um, if I were harsh, I would say he's a bit of a non-entity. Uh, he owes his getting out of South Sudan due to Justin Welby, and he's been a loyal servant to Justin Welby ever since he took office. He is not of the powerhouse that Josiah Wadawa Faron was. He's a 
competent, workmanlike fellow um, whose job initially was to help repair relations between Justin Welby and the GAFCON Global South World. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, so now he's being kicked upstairs. So he'll be a loyal, he'll be a Welby loyalist, but he won't be the opponent that uh, Josiah Wadawa Faron. If past practice is any predictor of the future, right. he won't be the fierce opponent of GAFCON and the Global South that Adawa Faron was. He'll just be in a tool of his master, Justin Welby. Ouch. Big words. All right, that's it for this episode of 736. I got that right. I guess the Benadryl's kind of wearing off, George. The, the, the mind is clearing up. We should probably do a show now, but it's too late. It's already the can. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 736 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>